Welcome, everyone. We're happy that you joined today's webinar. My name is Dr. Jeff Calvert. I am the Associate Director of Clinical Quality at the World Trade Center Health Program, which is a division within, within NIOSH and CDC. We're an honor to introduce this eighth installment in the World Trade Center Health Program's Clinical Best Practices webinar series. Please note that all of these Clinical Best Practices webinars are recorded, and these recordings are available on the World Trade Center Health Program website. Currently, the recordings for the first six webinars are available on the website. Today's webinar is titled Management of Depression and Suicide Risk in 9-11 Exposed Populations. It will be presented by one of our well-regarded psychiatrists who has a long-standing affiliation with the World Trade Center Health Program. And her name is Dr. Sandra Lowe. In addition to being a psychiatrist, Dr. Lowe is also the medical director of the World Trade Center Mental Health Program at the Mount Sinai Clinical Center of Excellence and is an associate professor of psychiatry and environmental medicine and public health at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. I'd also like to recognize my two NIOSH colleagues who are kindly assisting with today's webinar. First is Kiana Harper, who's responsible for all of the technical aspects of this webinar. And second is Ann Riddle, who was assisting with the slides and will be reading the questions and comments that you submit. Next slide. So we have a few disclaimers. First of all, the views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the official position of NIOSH or CDC. Mention of any trade names, commercial practices, or organizations does not imply NIOSH CDC endorsement. And finally, citations to ex websites external to CDC NIOSH do not constitute our endorsement of the sponsoring organization or their programs or products. Furthermore, NIOSH CDC is not responsible for the content of those websites. And then we have one disclaimer. One of our planning committee members, Dr. Rafael De La Hose, wishes to disclose that within the past 24 months, he attended promotional programs hosted by AstraZeneca and GlaxoSmithKline and received a lecture honorarium from Teva Denmark. All of these financial relationships have been mitigated. And without further ado, I present our speaker today is Dr. Sandra Lowe, who will be talking about managing depression and suicide risk in 9-11 exposed populations. Take it away, Dr. Lowe. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Calvert, and for inviting me to participate in this webinar series and to speak about a topic that is um, that I find very important to, um, to share with others. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking about management of depression and suicide risk in 9-11 exposed populations. And I hope that you are able to leave this presentation with a better understanding of the um, enduring health burden that depression poses on our cohort, and also that you will feel a bit more comfortable in screening for depression and suicidality in patients that you see. Um, and also uh, feel more comfortable in engaging in some very basic management strategies. So um, here is the uh, overview. Um, I'm going to start with uh, disaster exposure and mental health outcomes. And then I'll note some of the research on 9-11 related depressive disorders. I'll move on to screening assessment and management of depression with some special considerations uh, for the 9-11 exposed cohort. And then uh, move on to some specific strategies for suicide risk management and prevention. Okay, background on what we know about disaster exposure and mental health. It, most people are going to experience significant psychological distress following exposure to trauma or to a disaster. That is a normal experience. And the um, ex emotional reactions um, range broadly from fear to feeling panic to um, feeling shut down, uh, feeling sad, feeling guilt. Um, many of these uh, emotional experiences are accompanied by somatic symptoms like 
um, unexplained uh, pain. Um, however, research findings have confirmed that actually um, resilience is the most common response in following a, a disaster exposure. And even individuals who develop some stress-related symptoms end up coping well, especially if they have social support and, um, and recover from those initial reactions. Nevertheless, we do know that exposure to disasters and major trauma increases the risk of subsequent diagnosis of psychiatric conditions, um, in particular PTSD, which is well known, um, depressive disorders and um, uh, anxiety disorders. Um, and it also uh, worsens pre-existing psychiatric conditions. Um, and there is the risk of chronic disease trajectory and impairment for some individuals. The 9-11 terrorist attacks have been extensively discussed, um, yet the magnitude and the consequence of this event remains striking, especially for us who are working with the affected population. We know that nearly half a million people were exposed to potentially um, uh, potential environmental toxins and uh, traumatic um, events um, at the World Trade Center site. We know that nearly 3,000 people died suddenly. Um, many more thousands were injured, some severely. There was the exposure to the toxic dust cloud, which was incredibly frightening. And um, people had to evacuate burning and um, collapsing buildings. They witnessed horrific events in the process, uh, including people falling or jumping from the towers. Some were trapped beneath rubble and were sure that they would die. And others had the really difficult experience of leaving coworkers and friends behind as they ran to save their own lives. Over the months that followed, um, the community members and workers in the area had to um, evacuate or were displaced. Many lost their jobs in uh, downtown Manhattan. Um, and some residents actually went back and lived in the disaster aftermath. First responders, as well as the non-traditional responders, and those are um, the many uh, construction workers, iron cutters, asbestos, um, uh, abatement uh, crews, and the general uh, cleanup crews who were present and uh, took a, a a large had a large role in um, recovery efforts. They were um, exposed many times to unsafe and very long working uh, hours. Um, and many were tasked with work that they had no experience with or no training for, such as um, handling human remains, um, looking for body parts. Now, for many um, uh, individuals, this uh, dual exposure to both um, environmental and psychological um, hazards elevated the risk for subsequent medical and psychiatric conditions. And it also influenced the nature and the trajectory of subsequent health issues. Now, the World Trade Center Health Program was established to monitor and address the medical needs of this exposed population. It's a limited health, uh, federal health program that offers no cost monitoring and treatment for related conditions. Um, the, under the broad umbrella of mental health conditions within the program are um, are the ones listed on the right here. They include acute stress disorder, which is no longer diagnosed because that has to uh, be diagnosed within the first week, four weeks of exposure. 
PTSD, uh, which is the most commonly um, diagnosed condition in our pro uh, mental health condition in our program. There are the anxiety disorders, uh, which include panic um, and uh, agoraphobia, uh, but also subthreshold PTSD. That is PTSD symptoms that don't meet the full criteria for uh, PTSD diagnosis. Um, there is treatment available for substance use disorders, which are so common, comorbid with many of uh, the diagnoses. And um, the, uh, there are a lot of resource, resources on mental health and information on coverage on the uh, World Trade Center Health Program webpage listed here. Now, um, depressive disorders are chronic, they're recurrent, and they're debilitating conditions that um, worldwide uh, represent a significant source of disability. Within the program, these are the covered conditions, um, major depressive disorder, MDD, which is the most severe of the depressive conditions and the third most diagnosed mental health condition. Uh, dysthymia, um, which is outside of the program now known as persistent depressive disorder, which describes what it is. And the last two, adjustment disorder with depressed mood and medically associated depression. These categories capture individuals who develop clinically significant depression following a diagnosis uh, or treatment of a World Trade Center related serious um, uh, medical illness um, like cancer or uh, progression of COPD. Talking a little bit about uh, research. Now, most of the research on mental effects uh, post 9-11 have focused on PTSD. Nevertheless, there is a growing body of literature on depression, and I will uh, take a few minutes to talk about those. The research areas have been exposure and what is the risk of depressive disorders? What are the predictors of chronic illness? Um, the effects of comorbidity, because it's so common, and um, a little bit on resilience post-trauma. I'll start with this paper. Um, which describes the persistent health impact of 9-11. And it took a look at uh, four concurrent um, physical and mental health conditions in um, about 37,000 World Trade Center health registry enrollees. And the registry is a cohort of exposed workers and community members. Um, and they found that 15 years post 9-11, the average number of conditions per exposed member was high, 2.7. Keep in mind that this number does not include the non-World uh, Trade Center uh, conditions, uh, such as hypertension, diabetes, uh, um, attention deficit disorder, um, so that is, um, so the actual number is much higher. Um, the prevalence of these four conditions that were looked at were significantly higher than that found in the general population. Um, and this was 15 years after exposure. Um, the researchers also found that depression in particular was associated with low health-related quality of life and um, low productivity. 47% um, of individuals with depression reported that they had to limit their usual activities due to their depressive symptoms. And two-thirds reported overall fair or uh, poor health. Several studies have taken a look at the longitudinal de uh, determinants of depression. And this study found that one in five individuals uh, had symptoms of depression and 25% had uh, symptoms of PTSD 
again, 15 years post um, 9-11. Um, and the determinants of ongoing depression, um, the, the most uh, significant determinant was a history of PTSD. <clears throat> Depression was present in over half of those individuals who had PTSD. Those individuals without PTSD, depression was present in about five to six percent. Additional uh, determinants of um, of depression, fifteen years later, included uh, low income, unemployment, and low social support. And you'll see that repeated in many of the studies. Uh, this study focused on the additive effects of PTSD, of depression on PTSD severity up to 15 years post 9-11. And here the x-axis is mean number of poor mental health days over the prior 30 days, and the y-axis is PTSD-related impairment. The top line is um, PTSD plus depression, and the bottom line is PTSD only. And it's pretty clear that the, um, the addition of, P of uh, depression had a significant impact on um, uh, uh, functional impairment um, related to both PTSD and depression. And um, contributors to depression and persistent depression and impairment um, also included post 9-11 trauma, which of course many of uh, our cohort have had, um, physical conditions and uh, unemployment, and again, poor social integration. Although most of the studies of disaster exposure in general have focused on pathological outcomes, there has been an increased interest in taking a look at factors that may promote resilience. And that's an important area of study, especially as we're thinking about what can be done to minimize the uh, adverse mental health effects in uh, future disasters or future traumas. Um, so we do know that there are a variety of responses to traumatic stressors, ranging from disability to resilience to what's called post-traumatic growth. And post-traumatic growth, PTG, is a construct that describes an adaptive response following exposure to a traumatic event that actually leads to positive psychological change. Um, and this is different from resilience, which brings you back to your baseline. Uh, Post-traumatic growth um, suggests that there is uh, an enhancement in say the quality of your relationships or in um, your uh, sense of optimism for the future um, or your sense of, um, of, of self-esteem and, and uh, capacity to manage stress. Now, um, PTG has been found in many populations and within the 9-11 uh, exposed um, uh, cohort, um, post-traumatic growth was associated surprisingly with high 9-11 exposure and not surprisingly with greater social integration and sense of uh, self-efficacy. A 2023 article on social support and uh, trajectories of depression in responders found that the av availability of at least one important source of social support at least one um, family or work um, community while participating in recovery efforts was associated with uh, fewer depressive symptoms years later. Um, so 20 years of uh, health effects research um, uh, 
findings are direct exposure to 9-11 stressors increases the risk of depression. That's pretty well established at this point. Uh, the prevalence, severity of and course of depression does vary um, based on uh, several factors uh, that I've listed on the right. We know that symptoms endure for decades because we still have patients coming into the clinical uh, centers every week um, with symptoms that they have ignored, never reported, were working and could not uh, go and get uh, treatment for. Um, so we know that the symptoms have persisted. Um, and we also know that the combination of PT and depression strongly predict impairment. It is a really, um, it's a really bad uh, combination of illnesses. Illness trajectory is mediated by various factors. Um, I didn't speak about the characteristics of the exposure, um, but um, individual risk and resilience factors. So um, this includes um, you know, uh, prior um, history <clears throat> of, um, of uh, mental illness, uh, adverse childhood events, but also for first responders in particular, it includes the cumulative occupational exposure that they experience because their job demands um, constant exposure to distressing um, and potentially traumatic events. Uh, lack or availability of psychosocial research uh, definitely affects the trajectory of, um, of illness. Um, and post-stressor adversities, if you develop a serious and progressive medical illness, if you lose your job, um, which also implies not just a financial loss, but also a loss of your identity as a worker um, and, and your cohesiveness with a community of worker. Um, <clears throat> uh, that's very sig uh, significant and persistent uh, symptoms. And um, you know, other traumas, of course, uh, wars, um, COVID-19, um, all of this is going to be additive. Um, so uh, ongoing work in this area is remains uh, really important. Okay, now I'm gonna focus on the best practices and I'm going to uh, cite three clinical practice guidelines. The American Psychological Association guidelines for treatment of depression and the VA Department of Defense guidelines for the management of major depressive disorder and the management of patients at risk for suicide. These are all very comprehensive. Um, and the reason that I have uh, cited three is because um, we have a diverse cohort. Some of them are uh, military, National Guard, some are first responders, some are civilians. So um, having several uh, guidelines uh, that were developed for different groups of people is helpful to, um, to cover our range of uh, members. Okay, so. Why screen for depression in the general medical center? Well, we already have heard about the prevalence and persistence of depression. And it's also true that about 50% of people who die by suicide have seen their primary care doctor in the month before their death. That may seem shocking, um, but various studies have, um, have documented this. Therefore, routine screening in all medical encounters makes sense and um, could substantially increase the likelihood that patients receive treatment early on, um, as opposed to later on when the illness might become more treatment resistant um, or more damaging. Um, all providers have an opportunity to mitigate suffering um, due to depression. 
And I think you have a responsibility to do so. Um, could also save lives. We also know that management of depression in particular is common in medical practices. Um, it's actually uh, the most common location for patients in the US getting um, treatment for depression. Um, and it's also safe. There are also barriers to mental health access that we're aware of. Um, uh, lack of access to mental health professionals. We've all discussed that and we know that is a significant factor, but also there is stigma, um, social stigma about seeing mental health professionals. So patients may not follow up with referrals to see a psychiatrist, um, but would be willing to be treated by their um, non-psychiatric uh, uh, provider. And we know that there is an ongoing need for mental health services in the cohort. So on this last point, um, this um, study took a look at mental health care needs in responders and almost half of non-traditional responders and 20% of police responders, um, FDNY was not uh, included in the study. Um, reported a need for mental health counseling and medication. Um, and um, the barriers to, to care that they cited included, I don't know where to get counseling services, especially for non-traditional responders, um, which really supports um, ongoing outreach and education efforts. Um, and for police in particular, there was fear of negative job consequences if it was discovered that they were getting uh, mental health treatment, which is really sad and unfortunate. The patient health questionnaire, uh, the nine item PHQ-9, is the instrument that is most widely used both in clinical and research practices. And um, it consists of a sequence of questions that ask about the frequency of symptoms over the past two weeks. Um, and it's rated from zero, not at all, to nearly every day. Um, the first two questions, little interest or pleasure in doing things, feeling down, depressed, or hopeless, are uh, what constitute the PHQ-2. And they're often done in uh, general practices when patients are getting their vital signs. And if there are affirmative answers, they are uh, then followed up. There's also question number nine, which addresses suicidal thoughts. So it's really important that if this um, assessment tool is being done, that it is reviewed before seeing the patient or while seeing the patient because you may need to take action. Now, um, these are the diagnostic criteria for major depressive disorder. And frankly, they very much follow the questions in the PHQ-9 or vice versa, actually. Um, the items cited here include um, persistent feelings of extreme sadness or marked loss of interest or pleasure. Um, one of those two must be present for two weeks uh, in order to meet criteria. And then there are the associated symptoms uh, listed here, excessive guilt, feelings of worthlessness, hopelessness in particular, the neurovegetative symptoms, sleep appetite, energy, impaired memory, psychomotor abnormalities, of course, uh, recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. Now for the diagnosis, um, these symptoms must cause clinically significant distress or impairment in function. And it is also important to rule out other causes of, um, uh, of these symptoms, such as uh, substances or um, or some medical conditions. And that's relevant for our cohort that uh, where there's so much medical comorbidity.
Now, um, these are some factors that um, are helpful to keep in mind when assessing um, our cohort. Um, you have to remember that everyone was exposed to potentially traumatic psychological stressors. So think about screening for other trauma-related conditions, whether it's substance use disorder or PTSD, um, because they, they are highly comorbid. Now, obviously, it's a population that has potential exposure to toxins and to the medical sequelae um, of that serious medical conditions. And um, frankly, the management of depression in a medically compromised person is, is just more challenging overall. Um, there's symptom overlap, uh, there's polypharmacy, there are going to be multiple medical providers. So a collaborative care approach is recommended. It really makes a huge difference. Um, and um, keep in mind that you can always refer to one of the clinical centers uh, within the mental within the World Trade Center Health Program, where uh, multidisciplinary um, services are available. Now, um, a depressive diagnosis that's particularly relevant for our population uh, are the medically associated conditions, um, and. Um, and they have been um, diagnosed with increased frequency over the past few years. An example of this is the adjustment disorder with depressed mood. Um, and that is clinically significant depression and impairment due to diagnosis, treatment, or progression of a serious medical illness. Th these are common in all um, uh, medical practices. Um, and um, it's important to diagnose them because there is, they're associated with increased overall mortality and suicide. Here are some best practices for managing depression um, and they're by no means uh, specific to, to psychiatric diagnoses. Your decision-making is important. Um, but particularly so in managing psychiatric conditions. Um, patient preference for treatment is associated with, um, with uh, a positive treatment outcome. Um, it's gonna be important to engage um, the support network whenever possible uh, because patients will need help. They're, they're pretty impaired when they are severely depressed. Um, offer first-line treatments first, of course. Do your best to reduce barriers to care access. Don't just give someone a referral or put it in the, the, the um, electronic medical record. Do your best to, for you or someone in your practice to make a direct connection. Help the patient schedule the appointment. Make sure that you follow, that you offer follow-up contacts. So you know, start taking this medication. I'm gonna call you in a week to make sure that you were able to get the medicine and that you're okay taking it. And then um, I wanna see you in a month to make sure that this is working because if it's not, we can talk about what some other uh, treatment approaches are. Um, and uh, using um, a standardized scale to monitor treatment progress is also really important. First-line treatments for depression include psychotherapy, antidepressants, and combined psychotherapy and medication treatment um, because that really may enhance treatment response in some individuals, particularly those who are more treatment refractory. These are the psychological treatments that are recommended by most uh, practice guidelines. And cognitive behavioral therapy has the highest evidence base. Um, there are various other uh, therapies that may be used. Um, however, 
um, one of the limiting factors is that this is going to require referral to a, a therapist, a mental health specialist. So, um, so in, th in the absence of that, um, you certainly can refer to self-help groups, peer support groups, AA, NA, Al-Anon are all very helpful. Um, and individual uh, and group formats are, are, are fine. Uh, they're actually very helpful for, and more helpful for some individuals, especially if it's their presence, their preference. The uh, medications, antidepressants are the mainstay. Um, the selective serotonin reuptake reuptake inhibitors and serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors are all first line. They're pretty easy to use. Um, the side effect profile is, is generally benign. Um, and for our cohort, these tend to be the same medications that we use to treat PTSD. So um, keep that in mind, given the comorbidity. Um, there is another very effective antidepressant, uh, bupropion, Wellbutrin is the trade name. Um, it's an excellent antidepressant, but it does not work uh, for uh, anxiety or PTSD symptoms. So uh, you might have uh, more limited use, but it is a great antidepressant. Remember to treat insomnia. Insomnia uh, is transdiagnostic. It occurs in depression and PTSD and all sorts of anxiety disorders. Medication like trazodone is, is uh, an excellent choice. And of course, you are going to have treatment-resistant depression at times, which may necessitate a psychiatric consultation. And it's important to, to keep this in mind because there may be treatment uncertainty, patients may not be responding, and there are so many other um, biological interventions that will make a difference. Um, so keep that in mind, um, and you may need to encourage patients uh, to follow through with the referral. Now, suicide risk assessment and prevention. Suicide is one of the most devastating outcomes of severe mental illness, and it remains a major public health concern. And you may encounter patients at risk for suicide in any setting. So let's talk about how to assess. I'm gonna start with some discouraging trends in suicide rates in the US. Um, Suicide rates have been rising for the past 20 years, 37% um, increase uh, uh, through 2018. And then there was a brief dip in 2019, 2020, which was encouraging. But unfortunately, as of 2022, deaths by suicide in the U.S. reached the their all-time high of um, almost 50,000 individuals who died by suicide. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, uh, of note, there is a significant difference, uh, gender difference, so that males have a four times um, higher rate of suicide than, um, than women. Um, and our cohort is mostly men, so keep that in mind. Um, suicide mortality. Um, it, one study found that there was an increased risk of suicide mortality. More recent paper did not observe, observe excess deaths. However, it's not just um, suicide. It's suicide is an outcome. It's a terrible outcome. Um, However, suicidal ideation reflects um, the intense suffering in individuals. So it's a, it, it's a target for treatment that we need to be aware of. Um, this study took a look at uh, suicidal ideation and responders 
and found that the prevalence um, at about the five to six year mark um, was about 12% in non-traditional responders, significantly higher than the US population. And in police responders, it was 2.2%, um, which is lower than the US um, uh, population. Um, this, uh, the difference in the rates um, by occupation um, have been discussed. And one um, consideration is that among police prior to disaster training may have bolstered resilience. Um, however, there's also the effect of stigma for police, which may actually have affected uh, reporting and there may be underreporting. However, the, the factors most closely linked to suicidal ideation include feelings of guilt, shame, hopelessness, alcohol use, and again, lower support. Best management practices for management. We went through screening using the PHQ-9, um, and I'll talk a bit about the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. But basically, you need to ask. You need to get more comfortable just asking. Conducting a risk assessment starts with engaging the patient, uh, maybe some motivational interviewing, um, assessing risk factors. And then I'll talk about some of the management strategies. OK, key risk factors. There are static risk factors that are just not going to be that helpful um, because, you know, uh, your gender, uh, we know, is associated with higher rates of suicide, but there's nothing that you can do about it. You can acknowledge it, but that's about it. So you're going to focus on the acute and modifiable factors. And what are those? Um, well, current symptoms, suicidal ideation, hopelessness, worsening medical or psychiatric uh, illness, recent losses and jobs or relationships and transition periods, including from uh, work to retirement or from psychiatric hospitalization. Um, those are, are kind of red flag uh, factors. And modifiable factors, these are things that we actually have the potential to do something about. So if someone has stopped treatment or uh, no longer has medication, you can help reconnect them with their mental health professional if they have one, or you can prescribe a medication that actually has worked for them. Active substance use, engage the family. Uh, the family is very grateful when providers do this. Um, refer to AA, NA, um, all of these uh, uh, groups that are uh, very effective. Um, I'll speak about firearm access. And isolation, think about what you can do um, in connecting individuals. And sometimes a follow-up call makes a huge difference. Now, this is the gold standard in suicide risk assessment, um, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. And it's a series of six questions. And what's nice about this is that it's plain language. And it actually tells you what to do. It, 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 uh, and uh, um, so it starts off with the first two questions about wishing you were dead or wishing that you would go to sleep and not wake up um, to, you know, have you started doing something to end your life? So the, um, this form, which is through the Columbia Lighthouse Project, a great site that has a lot of information and, um, and uh, educational uh, videos um, uh, really just uh, tells you when is it high risk and what do you do? When do you refer? When do you um, call uh, 988 or 911? Uh, safety planning is not likely something that's going to be done in medical practices. It's standard in mental health uh, practices. Um, the reason I bring it up here is that um, in talking to patients who are at elevated risk, 
one of the things that you can do that's very helpful is to talk to um, your patient about what are the warning signs, you know, and have them write it down. Just what happens? Is it that you stop responding to texts? Are you um, drinking um, when you know it's not good for you? Um, you know, remember that that's a sign. Um, you know, what, what can you do when you start doing that? Can you uh, go for a run? Can you listen to music? So that patients are able to have easy access and have this written down. They can also list who to contact, uh, whether it's uh, personal support sy systems or uh, professional. And having this done ahead of time, having it done when you're not in crisis makes a huge difference because when patients are in crisis, they're not gonna remember these things. So it's very helpful. Lethal means counseling, um, especially for firearms is really important because Firearms are used in more than 50% of suicides. So all it means is asking a person if they have access to a firearm and working with them to um, temporarily limit access. Um, things like separating uh, ammunition from their gun, using a gun safe, having someone hold their um, firearm during high risk uh, periods. And um, this is so important because um, intent suicidal ideation and intent uh, tends to peak so that if you're able to help someone through that period of time, which may be quite brief of intense risk, you could save their life. And one way to do that is to increase the distance between the lethal means um, and the patient at risk. And finally, there is care coordination. Um, for those fortunate enough to have case managers, it makes a huge difference. Um, engaging family and support network. Um, I've already talked about being really active and connecting with mental health treatment and follow-up. And make sure that you are providing crisis resources because you're not gonna be available all the time. And the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, it's great. Um, try calling it uh, and just saying, I am a uh, healthcare provider. I'd like to give this number to my patients in need. I just wanted to get an idea of what it's like, what I can tell them to expect. Um, and then you'll feel a lot more comfortable saying, um, let me offer this to you. Um, I just went through that. So um, summary, well, briefly summarize, um, there's an association between World Trade Center exposure and depression. And among those with depression, co-occurring PTSD, physical illness, substance use, lack of social support, uh, contribute to symptom persistence and impairment. Managing depression and engaging in suicide prevention strategies is something that you can do. It's feasible and safe. And you have a key role in the evaluation and treatment of these individuals who are in great need. I'll end by thanking all of the responders and survivors that I've gotten to know over a long period of time, um, the communities who support them, and the healthcare providers who work so hard to take care of them, and Tanayash for sponsoring this really important series on um, uh, clinical care. So I will stop here. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Lowe, for that very informative presentation. Um, I have a couple questions for you in our remaining time. Uh, first question, does social support have the highest correlation as being a buffer? It depends on uh, the individual. So yes, uh, it, it is one of those um, uh, factors that comes up repeatedly. Um, but uh, there's also pre-existing conditions that uh, makes a big difference. Um, my approach is to consider uh, all of the factors, either when assessing or when trying to come up with a treatment strategy 
for patients, but I think that social support tends to be underrated. And, you know, we are, we're social creatures. Um, connectedness is such an important factor for us. So um, strength and social support, it's, it's, uh, it's a very significant factor. Thank you. Um, uh, we have another question that came in. Why are we having PTSD newly diagnosed 22 years later? Oh, good question. Uh, we see this a lot. Um, it is newly diagnosed not because the symptoms are new, uh, but because patients are finally coming in and getting assessed. So patients wait for retirement at times, especially police uh, who fear job consequences. Um, patients don't know. I've had so many patients who don't even know what it is that is wrong with them. And they somehow get connected to a CCE and they get referred and they finally go, oh, I had no idea that this was what I had. Um, so there are symptoms that have not been recognized um, or patients who have sadly lived with symptoms for a very long time with illness that's getting uh, progressively worse um, before coming in. Um, that said, there are some, um, especially in, in our cohort, there, there can be delayed onset PTSD, but it's usually by you know a, a few years, not 20 years. Um, and also there are times when PTSD symptoms might uh, improve for a while and patients go, okay, I can manage this. Um, but then they get diagnosed with cancer and now all of their symptoms worsen and, 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 and it requires, they're now able to say, I need help. Um, we have two more questions. One is by an anonymous attendee that came in second. I'm going to go with them first because we won't be able to follow up with them. Uh, what are some of the services offered for our first responders who have a certified mental health disorder? Uh, um, it is um, the treatments that I uh, discussed, psychotherapy, psychopharm, um, group interventions, um, but also in the clinical centers, case management services are so important as a source of support and connection and to help patients, um, to ensure that patients are getting the treatment that they need. Um, so all, all of those interventions, um, there are also uh, advanced biological treatments for treatment de uh, resistant depression, such as um, ECT or uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation um, or esketamine, uh, nasal um, ketamine um, are available. And uh, esketamine uh, is particularly useful when there is really acute suicidality because it works faster. Wonderful, thank you. And I think uh, our lap time for our last question, um, given similar question overlap between the PTSD and depression questionnaires, how certain are you that a person has one or both? Um, you know, the, the um, although there are symptoms that are overlapping, uh, such as um, negative affect, uh, feeling depressed, feeling disconnected. Um, there are certain symptoms that are very specific to PTSD, such as re-experiencing um, the nightmares, uh, the flashbacks. We really don't see that in uh, depressive disorders. Um, the uh, heightened startle reflex is something that is... Um, uh, pretty specific to PTSD. Um, so there are clusters of symptoms that we know are PTSD. Um, there, PTSD, you can certainly have suicidal ideation and it, it's a condition that has a significant suicide risk, but there are enough that are uh, separate. Um, and there's about a 50% uh, um, co-occurrence of PTSD and depression. So you just may be seeing both and you need to diagnose and treat both. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. At this point, I'm going to transition it back to Dr. Calvert. So thank you, Dr. Lowe. Very interesting presentation. I think it was well received by our audience of over 100 people. And so now I'm going to talk about continuing education credits, which I mentioned we'll be offering, or we do offer continuing education credits for physicians, nurses, pharmacists, certified public health professionals, physician assistants. And so I recommend that you take a screenshot because there's some information on here that you want to be able to capture in order to get your CE credits. So I've got a list of steps to get those credits. First of all, you need to log into CDC train and I've got the website there or you could all Google CDC train. Then you need to find this course, which the simplest way to find this live course is to type in this, the search screen WC4740 and that'll bring up all of the available best practices webinars. Uh, um, if you want just this one, you would also include today's date, which is at 03-21-24. Once you find the course, you'll need to provide the registration code, which is World Trade Center Health, that the acronym World Trade Center Health Program, WTCHP. So you'll need to, that to advance. And if you're watching the recording, you'll, uh, to find the course, you would type in WD, not WC, WD4740. And then you'll click on the core to, to register, you'll click on the uh, register button to register for this course. So although you registered to attend today's, to get the link for today's webinar, you'll need to register again for the CDC train to get your CE credits. And then once you register, the, the system will ask you what type of CE credits you want. And that's where you indicate whether you're a physician, pharmacist, nurse, et cetera. Then you complete the course, which you've done, um, and you'll see a button that says mark completed. Once you hit that button, you can then move to the post-test. So the post-test consists of four questions. You'll need to get at least three out of the four correct. You'll have two attempts to pass it. And once you pass it, or uh, maybe even if you don't pass it, you can still complete the evaluation. And then once you complete the evaluation, then you can get your certificate for your continuing education credits. And then the next best practices webinar is not until May. So we're going to take a little hiatus for a couple of months. On May 23rd at noon, I'll be talking about cancer screening and cancer care best practices. And so I hope you can attend that one in a couple of months. And again, thank you for attending today's webinar. It's been a pleasure hosting you and until next time, take care and we'll see you in a few months.